though, we all know that pole arms, otherwise known as hafted weapons, that is long poled weapons, like this pole axe or like this winged spear, are some of the most effective weapons that have been used on the battlefield, at least hand to hand weapons. And they completely dominated ancient and medieval and renaissance world warfare. But what are and what have been the most effective pole arms used throughout history? Well, obviously that question requires unpacking effective for what, effective used by whom, in what period, for what context and purpose. I'm Matt Easton, let's now retire to my study to look a little bit deeper into this question. So I have listed some of the principal pole arms used throughout history and I've developed a ranking system for them. So we're going to be looking at spear plus shield, spear used two-handed, pike, winged spear or partisan or corsets, beaten, spiedo, things like that. So um, spear with lateral, you know, um, projections. Glaive, halberd, poleaxe, bill, flail, great axe, that is large two-handed axe, like a Dane axe, and alspies. And I'm going to be ranking, that is scoring, against four main criteria. Now, first up, I should say I'm not considering economic cost or difficulty of supply, manufacture, anything like that, although that obviously in history is a real factor, and I'm not considering durability. I'm going to measure these pole arms against how good they are in single combat, how good they are as massed troop weapons, formation weapons, how good they are specifically against cavalry, and how good they are against heavy levels of armour, medium to heavy levels of armour. So let's leap into ranking these, but before I do that I want to have a very quick word about our very kind sponsors for this channel and this video, who are Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is the hugely popular fantasy turn-based combat game. You can play absolutely for free right now on your mobile phone or PC, checking out the link below or my QR code on screen. With over 600 champions, Raid's the first game to bring a console level of gaming to your phone. Something that is so awesome about Raid, and I don't know any game that compares with it, is how many champions you can choose from, how you can level them up, how you can customise. My absolutely favourite thing is playing in the arena against other opponents. This month is actually huge for Raid. They've just released a brand new faction, the Sylvan Watchers with some amazing new champions. Forest Elves, Ents, Druids, Faze. These guys are awesome. They're all here and I can't wait to summon them all to play with. I love Wood Elves. If that's not enough, Raid's got a full lineup of events as well, along with a new season of the Forge Pass, where you can get your hands on some of the most powerful gear that the game has ever seen. Right now, Raid's running an awesome trick-or-treat Halloween event, where you can win a bunch of real-life and in-game prizes, including $1,000 Amazon gift cards, and some of the best epic and legendary Halloween champions in Raid. The best part, it's all free, and it's super easy. All you need is your Raid player ID. Just download Raid with my link in the description, then head to trickortreat.plarium.com to make it even easier. To make that even easier for you, I've linked it in the description below. From there, just enter your details, spin the wheel, and win your prize. And the special event runs October the 15th to November the 5th, and once it's over, it's over. So be fast, only new players can win this prize. So if you haven't tried Raid yet, then you can click my description down below, or the QR code on screen, and you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. That's the free epic champion, Rector Draft, 200k silver, one energy refill, and one XP boost, and one ancient shard, so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get into game. All of this treasure will be waiting for you up here in the inbox. And remember, this is only for new players and only for the next 30 days. So thanks again to Raid for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to these rankings. So without any more ado, let's get into these. First of all, let's look at spear and shield. Now, all of the other pole arms considered here are considered uh, used by themselves without another thing. However, I considered I had to separate spear and shield into its separate uh, category, partly because throughout history across the world, whether it's Europe or Africa or Asia, um, even North America, the spear and shield used together throughout history have been extremely important in the history of warfare. So I had to consider it. And also functionally against these four criteria, a spear and shield is a very different consideration to a spear used two-handed by itself. So spear and shield in single combat, I have given 10 points. That's right, because in single combat overall, uh, in most contexts without heavy armour, it is an absolutely supreme weapon combination. In contrast, spear used two-handed, I've given 
eight points because overall my opinion and my experience is that spear and shield being at the very top spear used two-handed although it's very formidable is not quite as formidable overall as spear and shield because you can just cover more lines with the spear and shield and close the person with a uh, two-handed spear down pike next i have given for single combat one point now some people might hate me for that because they were used for single combat however Overall, a 16 or 18 foot long pike is an awful weapon to try and use in single combat. Winged spears, also including partisans and spiedos, things like that, I have given nine points. Why? Well, so I consider it's slightly better in single combat than just the simple spear used two-handed because it has those side projections and they're very useful both in defense and offense and give you more attacking and defending options. So it's not quite as good as the spear and shield in my opinion, uh, but it is better than the simple two-handed spear. Now, next up is the glaive. I've given the glaive 10 points in single combat. The reason being um, that it's far more effective, I believe, than the simple winged spear or partisan because you've got more, you've got a far more powerful cut with it. It's a shorter weapon in general than the winged spear or the partisan usually is. At least uh, a lot of glaives are. They're usually sort of the same height as a person. So it's more maneuverable in single combat. Uh, very often they have a, a back spike on the other end, so you can attack with either end very, very effectively. So you've got a bunch of different options. It's a bit more geared towards single combat than massed combat, in my opinion. The halberd. So halberds are, generally speaking, relatively long. However, they have got a whole bunch of attacking and defensive options. You've got an axe, you've got a spike or a hook, and you've got a top spike. Um, but they are fairly long, and they can be fairly cumbersome. So I've given them eight points. Compared to the two-handed spear, they're not as nimble, not as quick, but you've got more options with them. Uh, the poleaxe, I've given 10 points, and again, like the glaive, so the glaive and the poleaxe in this regard are in the same category, I would say. They're very much geared towards single combat. They're a weapon to give to a bodyguard or a knight, someone who's expected to fight by themselves and could fight one-on-one -on -one with them, and they were used in um, tournament fighting, for example. Next up is the bill. Well, functionally, the bill's very, very similar to a halberd. It can chop, it can hook or spike, it can thrust, but it's fairly long, it's fairly cumbersome. I've given it eight points. It's a very powerful weapon, but it's a bit bigger and more cumbersome, a bit slower than something like a poleaxe or a glaive, so eight points. Uh, the flail, this might be controversial, I've given six points, and that's, it's a very simple and cheap weapon. We're not considering that here but it doesn't have an awful lot of options. You have to swing it to offend with it. You can't really thrust with it. Uh, it just doesn't, it's a fairly specialized and fairly cheap weapon. I consider it six points. It's fairly effective in single combat, but not as effective as, in fact, it's one of the least effective weapon on this list, except for the pike. Um, now the great axe, think of Dane axe here, as seen on the Bayer Tapestry. I've given that eight points, uh, which is less than a poleaxe because it's got less attacking options. You don't have the back spike or um, hammer. You don't have the top spike. You don't have the bottom spike. So it's got fewer attacking options. It's a simpler, earlier weapon. It's an earlier ancestor of the poleaxe. So I consider in single combat, a poleaxe is more effective than a Dane axe. Um, so therefore it should be fewer points than that. But nevertheless, it is still a pretty good weapon in single combat. It's not particularly big. It's not particularly cumbersome or heavy or long. So it, it's pretty effective in single combat. Eight points, I think, well deserved. And finally, the Alspice, um, which is um, quite a specialized weapon. Uh, but they tend to not be that long, so they tend to be like a short spear length. So actually, fairly maneuverable, fairly good in close combat. Perhaps, probably not most of the time as effective as something like a great axe, certainly not as effective as something like a pole axe or a glaive. Um, and I would say, personally, not quite as effective as the simple two-handed spear because they tend to be heavier because they've got a large amount of steel in them. So I've actually given them seven points. That might be controversial, but anyway, I've given them seven points for this. So next up, let's look at a massed ranks weapon. Um, so we're talking about here formations of troops using these weapons. How have I scored them? So first up is the spear and shield. 
10 points. Um, so again, throughout history, across the continents, through thousands of years, the spear and shield has been a very popular weapon for mass ranks. And there's a number of reasons for that. Number one, the spear gives you great reach. Number two, the, the shield means that you don't necessarily have to be wearing lots of armor, but you've still got a good level of protection. And very importantly, and why I think it absolutely deserves the maximum points, is that you've got a good defense against missile weapons just inherently by the fact that you're holding a shield. Okay, so at 10 points, that's kind of the kind of benchmark for the perfect, I think, overall in most periods of history in most parts of the world, uh, the best master ranks weapon, spear and shield. For the two-handed spear, I've given it eight points. So it's still, the spear is, the simple spear is used in two hands is a very, effective weapon for massed ranks of troops to use, no question whatsoever. However, I would say not as effective as the spear and shield because you've got no uh, defense from a shield, you, you're vulnerable to missile fire, blah, blah, blah. Okay, next up, the pike. Well, the pike, everything I just said for the two-handed spear goes, but it's longer. So I had to give it more points, okay? As a massed ranks weapon, I would argue that massed ranks of pikemen, whether it's in the classical era or the Renaissance era, are gonna beat massed ranks of spearmen in a straight up fight, quite simply because they can outreach them. They can start stabbing the spearmen before the spearmen can even reach them. Okay, so I've given them nine points. Not quite as much as the spear and shield. And the reason is because the pikemen are particularly vulnerable while they're holding their long pike with two hands. They're vulnerable, number one, to missiles. They can be shot at with arrows very easily and peppered with arrows. And secondly, um, they are potentially vulnerable to people closing on them, whereas the spear and shield still has the shield to protect, which might give you time to drop the spear and pull out a sword or a dagger or whatever, whereas the pike doesn't have a shield. Um, and for that reason, pikemen in the Renaissance often wore breastplates and helmets, and they were fairly well protected in other ways. But overall, I think the pike doesn't deserve as many points as the spear and shield throughout history. However, it deserves almost as many points. Um, the winged spear, I've given it, or partisan, I've given it exactly the same as the two-handed um, spear because I consider in mass ranks there's no functional difference between a winged spear and a normal two-handed spear. And in fact, winged spears traditionally and partisans have often been the weapons of elite soldiers or bodyguards expected to fight single combat rather than mass ranks of them. Um, so I would argue that actually there are some disadvantages to having those side things. Whilst you can push enemy incoming spears aside, they can get caught up in things and stuff like that. So overall, I, I just gave it um, one point, uh, uh, sorry, um, the same points as the two-handed spear, eight points. Now the glaive. The glaive is a perfectly serviceable weapon in mass ranks. However, again, it's catered more towards single combat they tend to be shorter. So assuming this is a shorter glaive, I have given it seven points. So it's still effective in mass ranks, not as effective as the longer partisan or two-handed spear because it doesn't have the reach. Now the halberd, on the other hand, tends to be longer and um, the halberd also has got other attacking options. So as well as being able to thrust exactly like a two-handed spear, you've also got a hook and you've got an ax. So um, I've given that eight points. Why have I not given it more points? Quite simply because it doesn't have the reach of a pike. It doesn't have the defensiveness of the, sword, um, of the spear and shield. Um, but it does have some other attacking options to it. So I've given it the same points for mass ranks as the two-handed spear. Although I have to caveat that by saying that there are some specific situations where the halberd might outperform the two-handed spear, but remember it's heavier, a bit more cumbersome than two-handed spear. So I think it's pros and cons. It, it some benefits, some, um, uh, some cons to it. Um, so I think overall eight points. The Poleaxe, I've given the same as the Glaive for the same reasons. It's a shorter, more specialized to single combat weapon. It's functionally, in some ways, it could look like a halberd, but the halberd's longer. So the halberd's better suited to mass combat than the Poleaxe is. I've given the Poleaxe seven points. The Bill, functionally for the purposes of this, for mass combat, exactly the same as the halberd. I've given it eight points. It's about the same length as the halberd, does similar things, chops, hooks, thrusts. The Flail, I have given, again, perhaps controversially, six points for massed weapon. 
it can't thrust uh, very well, it doesn't have an enormously long reach, it's not very long. You've got to swing it, which is not very good in mass ranks if you've got everybody with flails all trying to swing the thing and hitting the person behind. Not very good. I've given it six points. I actually think that was quite charitable. I think I could have given it even less, actually. I think it's a specialised weapon you give a few people. You don't give mass ranks flails, in my opinion unless there's some monetary economic concern, uh, a lack of metal, for example. Uh, the Great Axe, I have equally only given six points. Uh, the reason being, and that's one point less than the Pole Axe and the Glaive, it's similar to the Pole Axe and Glaive, but has fewer attacking options, and it doesn't have a top spike in general. If it did, then we'd probably class it with the Pole Axe here. Um, so I've given it six points. You've got to swing it to use it. It's not great in closed ranks, um, and so I think six points is fair. And finally, the Auspice. Now, the Auspice are used in mass, I would say, is in exactly the same category as the winged spear or the two-handed spear. So I've given it the same points. That is eight points. So very good. Not as good as a pike because a pike can outreach it. Not as good as a spear and shield because a spear and shield has a shield. Right, now let's look at that specific category of anti-cavalry. Now, this is a very specific category, as is the next one, which is anti-armour. Um, I think they both need to be considered because at various points in history, whether it's um, Rome or whether it's the Renaissance, dealing specifically with cavalry or dealing specifically with people in armour was hugely important on the evolution and choice of pole weapons or shafted, hafted weapons. Um, so I think that these deserve to be categories, uh, two of the four categories that we consider. So anti-cavalry, this is a very specific job now. And remember, this is going to come down to reach, pointiness, and how the weapon moves and opposes uh, moving horses. Uh, and bear in mind, the horses usually have lances. So a consideration here is, can you hit the horse because the, before the horseman's lance hits your ranks. Can you outreach the Lancer? So, first up, we've got Spear and Shield. Well, I think they're very good, um, and it's great that you've got a shield, but in this specific scenario, a disadvantage of the spear is using it one-handed means you have to hold it closer to the head and you have a shorter reach. So I've given it seven points. It's good, but not as good as some other things on this list. Now, Spear used two-handed in, con in contrast, I've given nine points because I think one of the massive advantages of using a spear two-handed over using a spear and a shield is anti-cavalry, specifically why you would choose to do it. And next up, pike, I've given 10 points and I'm sure you saw that one coming. The pike is absolutely, in my opinion, specialised to dealing with cavalry. It basically completely nullifies cavalry. Now, I know there were some exceptions in the 17th century where lancers used particularly, they essentially used other pikes on horseback. But generally speaking, against a normal lancer, a normal horseman, pike just completely neutralizes them. So it has to be 10 points. The spear used two-handed, the spear is shorter. So I've given it nine points, but it's still very effective. Next up, the winged spear or partisan. Now I've given this eight points purely for the reason that it is shorter in general than a two-handed spear, certainly shorter than a pike. So it's a very effective weapon against cavalry, uh, but, I've, but I've given it eight points. And bear in mind, not only is it slightly shorter, it tends to be slightly heavier because you've got those projecting lugs out of the side. Um, so I think eight points is fair. It's effective, not as effective as just a simple long, longer spear or a pike. Next up, the glaive. I've only given that seven points, um, and I think that was fairly charitable. I could have even possibly given that six points, but I think let's be kind to it. I've given it seven points here because it's shorter. Okay, so it's it's shorter even than the partisan. So remember, the partisan I gave eight points. The pike, the sorry, the glaive has got a a, a point on it, and is fairly nimble, it's fairly light. So I think seven points is fair. The halberd, I've actually given eight points. And the reason for that is, uh, following my reasoning of the previous scoring, halberds tend to be longer than glaives. So sometimes if you're using a glaive, you might find that the lancer is hitting you at the same time as you're hitting their horse or them with your glaive. Whereas with a halberd, you can usually hope to outreach the lance um, because halberds have very long spikes on them. So eight points for uh, anti-cavalry. Next up, the poleaxe. This is where the Polax falls down, in my opinion. I've only given it five points. So Polaxes, number one, are relatively short. They tend to be the height of a person or shorter, sometimes only five foot long. 
Also, they're quite heavy, okay, and they tend not to have very long top spikes. So quite simply, I think that the Polax is not very, it's, it's basically its weak point, in my opinion. It's not well suited to dealing with cavalry at all, which is why massed ranks use things like halberds instead. So the Polax have only given five points against cavalry. The bill, so exactly the same as the halberd in this regard. It's used to go a long top spike. It's about the same length. It's a fairly heavy pole weapon, which is actually good for absorbing the force of an incoming horse. Um, I've given it eight points, okay? So not quite as good as a two-handed spear, certainly not as good as a pike, but better than a spear and shield because you've got two hands to brace that weapon with. The flail. Again, this might be a controversial one. I've only given it three points. I think that the flail is particularly poorly designed to deal with cavalry. If you imagine someone charging on horseback with a lance, you can, whack, or you can whack the horse with the flail, you can whack the horseman with the flail, but by that point you've already got skewered by the lance. You're not going to stop the horse. Um, at best, you could hope to knock the rider off the horse, but they will have had several feet of lance into you before you get the, close enough to hit them with the flail, and you've got to swing the flail as well. The great axe, this is controversial. I've only given it um, two points. Now, why did I give it less than the flail? Quite simply because the great axe, in my opinion, if we're looking at a Dane axe, for example, doesn't have as long reach as the flail, but it has all of the same issues with the flail. You've got to swing it to try and hit the incoming lancer. So therefore, they're going to be lancing you long before you hit them with the Dane axe, and the Dane axe can't reach as far as the flail can. A flail being articulated can reach further. So I've only given it two points. I think that's a really a, a weak point of the Dane axe. Despite what you might see on the Bayer Tapestry, I think often we do actually see horsemen cutting down Dane axe people on uh, the Bayer Tapestry. And I do not think, I know some people would disagree with me on this, I do not think that the Dane axe or the Great Axe was designed to deal with cavalry at all. You've already got spears for that. Spears and shields in the time of the Battle of Hastings, perfect. I think the Great Axe is there to, to smash up shield walls, basically. They're there for single combat heroes and, and uh, the equivalent of knights of their time to really mess up enemy infantry formations. I don't think they're effective against cavalry at all. And finally, the Alspies. Now, the Alspies I've given nine points, which is the same as the two-handed spear. Functionally, as far as cavalry concerned, it's the same thing. Uh, it's maybe, you could argue, it's not quite as long as the, uh, the two-handed spear, but it, it's, it's, quite a, it's a slightly heavier weapon. It's got more uh, steel in it. Maybe I should have given that eight points, but I've given it nine points here anyway. So here's the final category before we come into the literal summing up and seeing what points these different weapons have accumulated. So against armor. And again, this is a specific category, but it's very important. In the age of, um, you know, the Romans, for example, adopting large shields and heavy armor, that was very... Uh, critical in the decision of weapons uh, being used in that period. Same thing in the late medieval period when you've suddenly got lots of people with brigandines and plate harnesses. Same thing in the Renaissance. Um, so armour, very, very important to consider here. So spear and shield. Well, you know I'm a big fan of the spear and shield and I've been scoring it highly. This is where I don't. Three points. My observation is that Spear and Shield is particularly poorly designed to deal with armour. The shield's great in defence, but it means that you're holding a spear in one hand and you close in on someone in armour, you're stabbing with the, with the one-handed spear, you don't have the power or the accuracy to get that long waggly spear into the places where you need to against the armour. In my opinion, Spear and Shield is just really poorly suited to deal with armour, and I think it's one of the reasons that the, uh, the Romans decided to go with heavy armour and using a short sword instead, get in close, find the gaps and stab in them. You can't really get in close, find gaps and stab into gaps very easily with a Spear and Shield, I'm afraid. You can't control the opponent's movement, you can't grab them because you're holding a shield, and you can't control that tip of that spear incredibly accurately or powerfully either. So, two-handed spear. Well, two-handed spear was actually quite popular for armoured fighting, although you have to bear in mind that doesn't necessarily, it wasn't at all specialised for armoured fighting, although there were some spears where they designed the heads a little bit more specifically than others. Um, overall, I've given it six points, okay? So it's sort of mediocre. 
Yeah, you can use it in armoured fighting, but it's not really specialised for armoured fighting. It's more a weapon that you can use against cavalry, you can use against light infantry, and you can use against heavy... You can kind of use it for everything. But the fact is that oftentimes, I think, using a spear in armoured combat, you'd often find you come in close, try and get a stab into a gap, but the weapon's quite long for that, and you'd end up close and grappling. You'd be using your sword, your dagger, wrestling, and so on and so forth. So, six points. The pike... Uh, where to begin? Well, let's just say I gave it two points. I think the pike is awfully, awfully designed to deal with armoured opponents. It's very, very long. You're not going to be able to deliberately poke it in any gaps. An armoured, a fully armoured opponent will literally just be able to charge a pikeman down and grab them. Um, so... Yeah, they did use them in tournaments. They did use them for tournament fighting, but I think it was more a novelty. They often used to do it over a barrier, and they did it in full harness. It's essentially one of the safest forms of tournament fighting you could possibly do, because how are you going to hurt someone in full armour with a pike? You're not. Okay, two points. Um, winged spear, partisan, spiedo, thing, something like that. I've given seven points, okay? My opinion is that it's slightly better against armour than the two-handed spear. Reason being, you've got those wings, you've got those lugs, you can hook, you can push, you can potentially bash if they're uh, spikes pointing out sideways, you can jam them into in gaps. So I think it's slightly better for fighting in armour than a two-handed spear is. So, as I say, I've given it seven points. Now, a glaive. A glaive I consider pretty damn good against armour, actually, because you've got a chopping blade you can give heavy blows with, you've got a thrusting blade, and it's a relatively short weapon, so you can half-sword the point in there. You've also got little projecting spikes very often that you can smash like a little warhammer, and you've got a back spike as well, and a fairly sturdy shaft. So actually, it's a little bit like a poleaxe, and we'll get to the poleaxe in a second, but I would say that the glaive is like a poleaxe, but better suited for fighting people in normal clothes or light armour. In other words, it's going to carve up lightly equipped people more easily than a poleaxe, but it's not quite so geared towards fighting in armour as a poleaxe is. So, a solid eight points. Next up, the halberd. Well, the halberd's a funny one because I've given it eight points, same as the glaive, but for different reasons. The, gla the glaive is shorter and better geared towards using in single combat, hence I gave it a better single combat score, but the halberd is more powerful you can say it's got an axe blade on it um and it's it's a fairly chunky most of them anyway a fairly chunky sturdy weapons and you've got a greater reach with it so it's different pros and cons to the glaive but i would say that it balances out at about the same score so eight points again now the poleaxe uh the poleaxe are given 10 points because if we're going to give any weapon the maximum points for fighting in armour. It's got to be the Polax. The Polax is absolutely optimised and specialised specifically for this job. It's what armoured knights chose to use against other armoured knights. It's, you know, it's shorter and nimbler and stronger than the halberd. Um, so better for fighting one-on-one. -on -one. And it often has um, adaptations that are of the you know, design of the point and the hammer on the back and things like that that are better designed for bashing armour than a halberd is. So, I would say that the halberd and the poleaxe are obviously related weapons. The, the poleaxe is more catered towards single combat and armour. The halberd is more catered towards massed combat in normal soldier gear, typical soldier gear. Now the bill, I've given exactly the same score as the halberd, because for this, this purpose, it's exactly the same thing. It can chop really strongly, but it's a bit long. It's not very well catered towards single combat, but it can hit really powerfully. And it's got the same kind of options as the halberd, so eight points. The flail, for fighting an armour, I've given seven points. Um... The reason being it can hit armour pretty hard. So uh, if it's a bit like a mace, essentially. You can just smash someone in any level of armour really, really hard, and it might put them out of action. It might break bits of their armour, dent bits of their armour, lock things up. So I think that, yeah, it deserves to get seven points, but it's not versatile. You can't thrust with it, you can't stab into gaps. You're pretty much limited to one type of attack. Uh, you could argue some wrestling thrown in and this kind of stuff. You can do other things with it, but by and large, it doesn't have a lot of hooks and points or anything like that. The Great Axe, similar. I've given seven points. You can bash very strongly with it, but it doesn't have anything like the offensive or defensive options that something like a pole axe or a glaive or a halberd does. So seven points. And finally, the Auspice. Now, this was very difficult, and I changed my score on this a number of times. 
I actually scored it lower originally, but I've moved it up to eight points. The reason being that it is really quite specialized to dealing with people who are wearing levels of armor because of the nature of the point on it. And it's not as long and cumbersome as something like a halberd is, which has a similar, halberd has a similar point, but the Auspice is a little bit better geared towards um, fighting in armor, I think, um, because of its nim nimbleness and things like this. So I've given it eight points. Um, so good, very good, but not the top end. Right, so let's have a look at the summing up. Who scored what? So overall scores are, and bear in mind this is just against those four categories, how good they are at single combat, how good they are as massed regimental weapons, unit weapons, how good they are specifically against cavalry, and how good they are against armour or fighting in armour. So the spear and shield got 30 points. The two-handed spear, so same spear used in two hands without a shield, got 31 points. That surprised me a bit. The pike got 22 points. Now that might sound very, very low, but remember that the pike is really specialized. And against these four categories, you know, it scored the maximum points against cavalry and it scored almost the maximum points as a massed unit weapon, but rubbish as a single combat weapon, rubbish against armor, so 22 points. The winged spear, or partisan, or spiedo, or corsac, has 32 points, which makes sense. It's one point more than the simple spear in two hands. Makes sense, similar weapon, just got a few more options to it. The glaive, quite a different type of weapon, also got 32 points. Uh, it surprised me how many ties we've got here. The halberd. Very different type of weapon in many ways, looks very different. But when we actually added up all these points, 32 points again. <laughs> the pole axe. Now, the pole axe again, I've said the pole axe and the, and the halberd, similar weapons, different strengths and weaknesses. 32 points again. The bill. Well, the bill's very similar to a halberd, isn't it? Functionally. It's a different shape, does basically the same things. It can hook, it can chop, it can thrust. And it's a similar length, similar weight. 32 points, exactly the same points. Flail. Flail, very cheap weapon, might be very good at specific things like hitting around people's shields or uh, striking over the edge of fortifications or a war wagon as the uh, Bohemians would have used it. 22 points though, it's just not very versatile. Not very good in single combat, not very good in massed combat, not, uh, not particularly good against armor, that's pr probably what it's best at and rubbish against cavalry, I would personally say. So overall, the flail's pretty weak. And I think when we look at the popularity and history of the flail, i.e. not very popular, it's not that surprising. The great axe. Now I have to be honest, I'm a fan of two-handed axes, Dane axes, so this quite surprised me. It only got 23 points, but you have to bear in mind that it's an earlier type of weapon. What we're comparing here is a weapon that was already in existence in the 800s and 900s with types of weapon that were not developed for another few hundred years. You know, things like the halberd and the partisan um, and the, uh, the bill didn't really come into their own until the 15th century, like 500 years later. So it's kind of an unfair comparison, isn't it? Because the great axe evolved into the pole axe and the pole axe is up here at the top uh, with the others. And finally, the Auspice. Now, the Auspice seems like a very specialized weapon. So actually, this score surprised me. It's also got 32 points. So what we have here is a tie, folks. We've got a tie at 32 points, the top points between the winged spear, or partisan, the glaive, the halberd, the poleaxe, the bill, and the Auspice. Now, you might think, oh, that's a real cop-out to have all of those weapons tying. But do you know what's for completely different reasons? And I spent quite some time mulling over these points, and I think it's fair. And actually, when you look at 15th and 16th century warfare, what were the most common pole arms in use? Well, pikes were the most common, but used for very specific reasons and as part of a combined force. So pikemen were used with muskets and um, missile troops. And those two things in unison worked fantastically because the pikes protected them from the uh, cavalry while they were re reloading and shooting. So in a way, you could say that the pikes, while they were used offensively, they sort of got rid of a lot of the other considerations in order to perform one specific job or a couple of specific jobs. 
So the pike's a very specialised thing. If we take the pike out of the equation, what we see is the spear and shield and the two-handed spear did very, very well, and they feature widely in history, don't they? Um, and really, what's the difference between a two-handed spear and a pike, you could say? Why is the pike so low and the two-handed spear is 31 points? It's almost up there at the top with the others. And fundamentally, it's to do with versatility. The pike has gone so exaggerated and so far, you know, 16 or 18 feet long, it's so unwieldy in single combat, it's useless almost against armour. Whereas the two-handed spear down at, let's say, 10 feet or 12 feet long is far, far more versatile. That difference in reach means that, yes, if you have a unit of pikemen versus a unit of two-handed spears, the pikemen are going to win most of the time. But in every other scenario, the two-handed spear is more versatile. So I think it makes sense that, you know, we've got the, we've got the partisans, we've got the glaives, we've got the halberds, we've got the pole axes, we've got the bills, uh, and we've got the altarpiece, and they were some of the absolute most popular um, and versatile pole arms that were in use at the end of the medieval period and going into the Renaissance, really when gunpowder was starting to change warfare forever. So it makes sense. I think the scoring is, whilst it might not be perfect, I think we've come out at more or less the right result. That none of these pole arms is specifically better than another overall, but some of them are definitely better at specific jobs. I hope that's been fun to watch um, and send your thoughts, your reactions, your disagreements. Um any other weapons I should have considered? Um, I'm happy to, if you've got other specific pole arms you want me to consider, it might be that they kind of come under one of these categories I've considered under here. But I'm really fascinated to see what you make of my scoring of these. If you agree, if you disagree, get posting down below. Check out the links in the description below this video as well. Uh, please give me a like, it makes a huge difference uh, to my channel. And um, if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so. I hope I'll see you back on the channel really soon. I have been Matt Easton and I will continue to be. See you soon folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.